Hello, sweethearts. Welcome back to Delight in Discipling, and thank you for being with me today. We're going to talk about three different uh, aspects of being married to a spiritually mismatched husband. Uh, the first one is how we walk the walk. The second one is how we pray for our husbands. And the third one is how to tell the story of Jesus. Thanks for being here. Let's get started. Thank you again for being here and this is Delight in Discipling where we talk about discipleship and we talk about um, a Christian life experience and what that means and today we are continuing in our series on the reading the book Spiritual Mismatch by Lee and Leslie Strobel. We are past halfway through the book you can watch this and get benefit from it even if you have not read the book. So I uh, hope that you stay uh, with me and uh, learn a few things about that. And um, the other thing that occurred to me as I was prepping for this video is that some of you are wondering why would I listen to Robin um, because she's been married for over 48 years and 43 years spiritually mismatched. She can't know anything about this. But in fact, I know a lot about it and a lot about the struggle. And the reality is I did not know when I committed my life to Jesus how long it would take for my husband to join me on this particular journey. And the reality is you don't know either. And you may find yourself in a 30 or 40 year journey or you may find yourself in a 30 day journey and this material will still be helpful for you. So to begin uh, this video, we're gonna cover chapters seven, eight, and nine. And chapter seven is entitled, Before You Tell Your Spouse About God. And it really is the prep. It is about prepping your heart, prepping your life, getting faithful to your walk with God, and really solidifying what you personally believe about Jesus Christ. I'm not going to say a lot about this because we've talked about that in previous videos and there's a lot of material, a lot, you know, literally hundreds of books about how to walk as a Christian with Jesus Christ. All I want to say that as you are um, on this journey and trying to impress upon your husband the importance of knowing and loving God, the most significant aspect or the most significant factor will be your personal walk with Jesus Christ. And you are going to have to be diligent as I am diligent in being faithful and responsible to walking in a manner worthy of God. And that's difficult and it's not easily done alone. That's why I continually encourage you to find a discipleship relationship, be involved in your church family, attend Bible studies, and continue to seek, be teachable, and be a lifelong learner about what it means to follow Jesus Christ. That single aspect of your life will have more impact on your husband than anything else I'm going to tell you, is that he is a close observer of you, and he really wants to know is what you're saying is really what you are living. But you are not looking for perfection. You are looking for a process and progress. So don't think that, that by any stretch that I have reached some level of perfection because that's never going to happen and it's not going to happen for you either. But what we are looking for is progress in our faith where over time we are becoming more gracious, more loving, more forgiving, um, more caring, all of those aspects, all the fruit of the Spirit, that's what we're looking for. And those factors in our life are growing and those disciplines are growing. So next, ladies, we're going to actually skip chapter 8 for a minute. We're going to jump ahead to chapter 9, which is called The Power of a Praying Spouse. We're going to cover that next because I want to tell you two things about that. The first one is that most of your prayers should be for yourself that you should consistently go before the Lord and ask Him to change you, to improve your attitude, to give you hope, all of these things. And this is my example. So in the book, there's a chapter in an appendix called Your 30-Day Prayer Adventure. It is really, really good. It's, it's just an excellent 30-day uh, journey of praying. And I'm going to give you some of the titles so you understand the point I'm making. 
So day one, for instance, is pray that God would strengthen and deepen your faith. Day two, pray that God would help you keep him first in your life. Day three, pray that God would give you contentment in the midst of your mismatched marriage. Day four, pray that God would bring a spiritual mentor into your life to help guide, encourage, and challenge you. Day five, pray that God would soften your heart towards all people who are outside his family, including your spouse. And this goes on and on and on. Now, eventually he has tips and how to pray directly for your spouse. But the first thing I want and hope that you understand is that we are still in this process and we still need God's help and we still need to yield our heart's desires to him. We, we need to submit to God's authority. We need to conscientiously embrace what God has for us. And that is often done in prayer when we're quiet before the Lord, when we're seeking his face and we're reading the Psalms and, and often says, I just um, was uh, reading through Psalm 27 yesterday, and it talks about seeking his face. And when we do that with a genuine heart and a desire to be transformed, then God answer the, answers those prayers for us. And he brings us in alignment with his will for us. And then it better equips us to then pray for our husbands. The second thing I wanna mention about that and about prayer is to pray faithfully for your husband. In the book, if you've read it, and again, you don't need to read the book to understand or appreciate these um, little tips and instruction that I'm giving you, but he gave a number of stories where women were praying for years, months, decades in some cases for their husbands. And consistently, those women said they never gave up and it was worth it. All of that time spent on their knees, all of that time pleading before the Lord, all of that time that God was shaping their heart, it was worth it. So two things to remember about chapter nine is pray for yourself first, for you to be transformed into the image of Christ and pray endlessly faithfully for your husband in his salvation. So we've covered two points so far. The first one is to walk the walk. The second is to pray and pray faithfully. And the third one is tell the story of Jesus. So I'm going to make a departure from the book, Spiritual Mismatch. This book, so I'm going to set this aside for a minute because I want to go in a little bit different direction for you with this and how to tell God's story. When this book was published in 2001, I believe it was, um, there, it was not a popular concept to teach scripture as a story. And there are basically four ways to understand scripture. And the two that I'm going to cover today, the first one is systematic theology, which basically was the approach that Lee Strobel took. And it was what, how he learned scripture was systematically studying doctrines. And you'll see that even in his books, you know, the problem of sin, what is grace, what is the Holy Spirit or who is the Holy Spirit. So he took certain doctrines and examined them to see if they were true. That's called systematic theology. It is a system of understanding scripture, but far more popular now and far more approachable now is what's called biblical theology. So I'm going to give you some resources. I'm going to explain briefly what it is, but I'm going to give you some resources and I'll link them in the description and, and I'll explain why I think this is beneficial to you. So the, for chapter eight, the title of the chapter is what to say when words are hard to find. Telling the story is often the easiest way to find the words to speak. And that is what biblical theology is. I looked it up to find a simple definition is biblical theology seeks to understand the progressive unfolding of God's special revelation throughout history. Different than systematic the theology, which systematic theology seeks to present the entire scriptural teaching on certain specific truths or doctrines one at a time. For instance, sin, the Holy Spirit, sanctification, justification, salvation. So 
I hope I've made this clear. Biblical theology is starting in the book of Genesis and understanding this overarching redemptive story that God is telling throughout scripture. So my point is in this is to know your man and adapt your approach. So if you're an older generation like I am, it might be that you approach your husband or you tell him about Jesus or you tell him about God in a systematic way. One is not preferable to another. It's knowing your husband, knowing how they relate. If they're a moviegoer and they read a lot and they read novels and fiction and and biographies, then you can assume that they like the story. They like the beginning. They like the friction. They like all those elements of a good story. You always have a hero. You have an adversary. You have a redemptive story. There's always going to be tension or strife and how that's resolved. So if that's your husband, then I would strongly encourage you to know what the biblical story is, what, what biblical theology is. So I'm going to tell you what it is in just a second because I have another book here I'm going to share. But I also am going to link to for you some um, short, short information. This is from Crossway, which is a really solid um, Christian publishing company. They publish a lot of Bibles. You probably, If you have multiple Bibles, you probably have one published by Crossway. Um, this article is 10 Things You Should Know About Biblical Theology. Good, succinct little article. If you want the big story, you want to know everything and how that unfolds, I would suggest you read literally the book, The Big Story. And it's how the Bible makes sense out of life. And it's going to start you in Genesis and work you through scripture to enhance your understanding of every step as God revealed in scripture the steps of his unfolding story, uh, culminating in a revelation with new creation. It's a fascinating read and I do recommend that. Another one is sharing Jesus without freaking out. Um, a section of this book talks about the biblical theology approach and um, it's not again it's not it's not favorable over one. What you want to know is how your husband would re relate to truth. You're not altering truth. You are adapting the way that you communicate. So that's, that's some resources for you. So briefly, this is what I'm going to share with you. Uh, one of the best books I read this summer or in the spring actually is called Enough About Me by Jen Oshman. It's Finding Lasting Joy in the Age of Self. An excellent re read even for a woman like myself who's aged, um, but for a younger audience, particularly, um, you know, the millennials, uh, Generation X, even Generation Z, who are sort of self-absorbed. Excellent, excellent read. And she has a brief section in the book that she talks about biblical theology to help us understand that we are not the center of the universe, that there is something else going on that is bigger than us. So basically, biblical theology has four points. Uh, we are created by God and created for God. And, and the story begins in Genesis. Now, um, God existed before Genesis, but what we know in Scripture begins in Genesis. So we start there in the beginning and the creation of, of two people made in God's image, Adam and Eve, and they were created in God's image for him and by him. So that's the first element of the story. The second element of the story just happens two chapters later in Genesis 3, and we have sin entering the world. We have disobedience by Adam and Eve. Uh, Adam and Eve deciding that they want to be like God, a promise that Satan had made to them. And it devastated them, it devastated the heart of God, and, they, they, and creation come, came sort of tumbling down what's often referred to as the fall of man, or simply the fall. So the first part is creation and creation of, of perfection in the garden and a perfect relationship with God. That relationship is broken a short time later. We don't know the span of time. It's one chapter in the scriptures, but we don't know what length of time that Adam and Eve lived in perfection with God. But we know that that, that, that ended and that was the fall. 
The third element is the promise of redemption, that God said, I am going to fix this. Not we are going to fix this. This is what mankind has tried to fix the earth for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. We are not the fixers. God is the fixer. So after the fall, we have the promise of redemption. And that promise to fast forward all the way to the New Testament, that promise appears in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John when Christ is born. And, but there's, if you read some of these other resources, you'll get, you'll get the, um, the intricate details of how, how God was patient and, and long suffering with his people, with those people that he wanted to have relationship with. But the story didn't end until we get to, well, the story didn't end at all yet, but until we get to um, the New Testament and the arrival of Christ and the birth of Christ as the Redeemer, that's the next significant step in the four uh, steps of the biblical story. So we have a creation, we have the fall, we have the arrival of Jesus Christ, redemption. Then that part is the life of Christ. So it's him um, rising up, identifying himself as God, teaching disciples, uh, going to the cross, dying for all of us, um, absorbing all of our sin, all of our evil doing, all of the sin from Genesis forward to eternity to today, all of that was absorbed by Christ on the cross. His death, his resurrection, the promise of new life, conquering death. So that's the third element is this redemptive story. God wins. He is winning back his people. And it is through our faith in Jesus Christ that our lives are redeemed. So that's the third element. And then the last one is full restoration or in some, in some ways you'll read restoration or new creation. So our story right now and the, husband, the story of your husband has not concluded yet. And the conclusion of that is new creation or, or full restora restoration with God. And that will happen when we are with Jesus in heaven and have a new heaven and a new earth and a new life and new bodies and no decay and no tears. So that, in a nutshell, is the biblical story. Now, I share that with you because if you're a younger generation, that is going to resonate with you much more. I had never heard that story and how it was laid out until about 2008, 2009. And even for me, who was a seasoned believer, seasoned, I mean, I, I knew a lot, and I had studied under systematic theology, and I could... I could actually teach and explain the doctrine of sin and the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. But until I heard the biblical story, all these puzzle pieces were just that. They were puzzle pieces. Great information. I'm glad I knew it. I'm glad I was taught that way. But my life and all these puzzle pieces of my life came together in a much grander way through the biblical story. So my third point is in learning how to tell the story or telling the story to your husband is to know your man, to know how the age demographic that he is, how he relates to the world. If he's a scientist and likes little details and likes uh, particular like word studies or will, will study in that way, then he'll probably love systematic theology. If he has, if he's a younger generation, he's probably going to love the story of God. And you have a parallel story. Once you came to Christ, you have a story before Christ and now you have a story after Christ. And he's observing that. Perhaps he knew you before you knew Jesus and he can relate to your story. This, again, this process of development and maturation in Christ and that will resonate with him. So I'm going to leave it at that. If you want more information about that or you want me to discuss it further, just let me know, put a note in the comments. So I'm going to um, conclude with um, a few things, just tell you where we're going with the channel. We have one week left um, next Sunday at 8 a.m. So this, this released it's, uh, Sunday morning at 8 a.m. and I have one more video releasing next Sunday at 8 a.m. And that will conclude this book. The next book that we're going to do, 
um, and we're just going to do this over three weeks, is called For Women Only. This is for a more general audience. It's not just for women married to unbelievers. I'm going to put a twist on it. I've even re read sections of this to my husband, and I'm going to share with you some of his comments. The subtitle of this book is What You Need to Know About the Inner Lives of Men. And uh, I won't say any more than that. If you want to follow along and read, then in the next couple of weeks, get this book. It's the, first, the next one that we're going to do. So it's for women only by Shanti Feldhahn. And it's just nine chapters. And you can tell by the size of it, it's, you know, it's a smaller book. And it's not, it'll be an easy book for you to read and pick up. I'm sure it's available on Audible and um, certainly Kindle. So that's where we're going next. Um, ask me any questions that you want to know and uh, please share this series even if you are married to a believing husband someone in your life is not someone that you know and is dear to you is not married to a believer it is becoming more and more common ladies and as our culture just sort of expands and is looser and our doctrines uh, are watered down and diminished we have more and more mismatched marriage so I just ask you to share this and please subscribe to the channel I looked at my demographics last week and uh, about over 90% of my viewers are not subscribers so it, it helps expand the channel and el helps expand the reach of the channel um, as you subscribe because it shows interest in the channel and then uh, YouTube is more likely to recommend it to someone else looking for spiritual material. Okay, I'm concluding with two last things. I've been promised you each week that we are looking at attributes of God and I, I kind of keep this here to remind you and me. So, and we have a helicopter, I'm gonna wait. Okay, we're gonna cover two attributes of God today. One is immutable. Uh, God does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And I selected that one because the God in Genesis, that God, that glorious God, that everlasting God, is the same God in Genesis as he is in Revelation. That is the same God. He is not changing. We change. We are human. We, you know, have a lot of factors that change about us. But God is immutable. He does not change. So the God that Adam and Eve knew perfectly in the garden is the God that we will know in the new creation. And I can hardly wait. I am so excited for that. The other thing I want to bring to your attention and I want you to just embrace is that God is omnipresent. God is everywhere. His presence is near and permanent. Permanating. So if you're weary of praying for your husband, not to fear, not to be concerned. My husband's at work as I'm recording this. He's not here, but you know what? God is there. God is with him. God may not be inside him yet, but God is with him and orchestrating life around my husband and your husband and you and me. I, I will conclude the... Um, I'll share with you the passages of Scripture, Proverbs 15, 3. The eyes of the Lord are everywhere, observing the wicked and the good. So God sees everything that's happening. So coincidentally, this morning when I was doing my devotion, I have shared this book with you a number of times. In fact, on my intro, when you see me holding books in my hand, this is one of them, New Morning Mercies. I love Paul Tripp. I talk about him frequently, and I do this devotion. I'm recording this on July 21st, and this was today's devotion, and I just loved it, and I had to share it with you. So I'll conclude with this. Your story is not an autobiography. And what that means is we are not writing our own stories. I'm not sitting here writing my story. Your story, my story, is a biography of wisdom and grace written by another. That another, of course, is God himself. So that's the first thing I, I want to emphasize in this little reading, is that you think, you may think that you're orchestrating your life and you're running your own life, and I sometimes think that way too, but that is not true. I am a piece of God's bigger story. And if you are a Christ follower, you are as well. Even those of, like our husbands, they are still part of God's story. They may not know him in heaven forever, but they are still part of what God is doing and using to accomplish his purposes. So I'll quickly read the rest of this. Every, every turn he writes, he being God, 
Every turn he writes into your story is right. Every twist of the plot is for the best. Every new character or unexpected event is a tool of his grace. Each chapter advances his purpose. This is quoting uh, Hosea 14.9. Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right. It is almost a gross understatement to say that God's ways are better. How could they not be? He is infinite in wisdom and grace. Thank you, ladies, for joining me again this week. I love you. I love hearing from you. Be encouraged. Say the course. Don't give up. Never stop praying for your husband. Walk the walk. Learn how to tell the story of God so that it has an impact on those that you know and love. I love you, and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.